Welcome to First in Future. I'm Leslie Boney with the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University, and this is a show about the future of North Carolina. Each week on this program, we try to find someone who is looking ahead, imagining our future, has some ideas about what we need to do and how we need to get there. So no pressure, Meb and Rash, but thank you for being with us. Thank you. Mebin is the CEO and Editor-in-Chief of uh, Education NC and the NC Center for Public Policy Research. That's right. Um, Ed NC is an organization. We've been around about three and a half years, and we provide citizens and policymakers with nonpartisan, independent data, research, news, information on the trends, issues, and challenges bearing on education. But most importantly, we tell stories. So there, there are a lot of people who work on education. But one of the things that strikes me that distinguishes Ed NC is that you view this rather than a one-way conversation where you're providing data to people, sending it out. You're, you're trying to convene a conversation. How do you do that electronically and how do you do that in today's uh, media age? So one way we do it is we travel a lot of miles. We, uh, we were calculating it up and our staff traveled 66,251 miles over the last school year. So we were out and about all across the state talking with people across all the lines of difference. And sometimes that looks like students and sometimes that looks like people in schools and sometimes that looks like people in churches and people in communities. Um, but we do also use technology to have those conversations. So we have um, a, a, an initiative called Reach NC Voices and that allows us to have two-way conversation with people about the issues that are most important in their lives and sometimes that looks like a text message conversation. It can also look like people taking surveys. Um, it can look like something called chatbots which was something I had never heard of before last year. <laughs> uh a lot of people care about education. Everybody has either been in a classroom themselves or they have a child who's in a classroom or they think they know something about education. And the truth is everybody does, but not everybody knows exactly what to do about it if they have opinions. And you try to provide people some kind of on-ramp for that, some, some way they can do it. So people might in general know that there is a thing called a PTA or there. Uh, are these things called school board meetings or there are opportunities to go to the legislature or to your legislator and say something, but you're trying to provide them a variety of opportunities that maybe show them how they might take those ideas that they have and turn them into something that could be meaningful. Yeah, and so one of the challenges of being in kind of the new media space is that um, our audience gets to drive a lot of the work that we do. It's not about just us deciding this is what we want to do and this is how we're going to do it. It's about what do people really want? What kind of information do they want? How do they consume that information? Where do they consume that information? And then we try to meet our audience's needs. And so we do have an opportunity for people to write perspectives and talk about the different education issues that are playing out in their lives. And um, that's been a good way for people to share those perspectives with policymakers. Um, so one of our most read pieces was an article by a teacher um, about the real problem with teaching. Um, and so was, people had a lot of guesses about what that would be. But for her, it was all of the unpaid hours that go into a teacher's life. Um, as they work with the different challenges they see in their students' lives or their communities' lives to build a better place for um, the future, right? These communities of the future that all of our teachers are working to build. It strikes me that the way you're thinking about public policy is probably different than the way that your parents thought about public policy. Both of them were active, kind of iconic Charlotte people. Um, your dad was known to some as the mayor of the fourth ward and your mom was actually mayor pro tem of Charlotte. Uh, did you have strange public policy conversations growing up? I mean, could, could you have normal conversations or were they quizzing you about what you knew about the world? My brother would say they were quizzing us. I was enough of a nerd and a wonk not to feel like it was quizzing and to actually love it. The, the journal of the North Carolina Center for Public Policy Research is called North Carolina Insight and it I grew up with it on our coffee table and read every word and grew up wanting to do this work. Um, but in part, it wasn't just because of my parents, it was because of all of the people in my life. So I lived on this very interesting block that included 
Harvey Grant and Mel Watt, who are Democrat policymakers and um, well known, but also Sue Myrick and Dan Forrest, who were Republican policymakers. Dan Forrest is our lieutenant governor. Um, but he and I went to school together. And it was in the mix of all of those ideas and in the conversations that we had at Potlucks on Ninth Street um, that I thought the best ideas emerged. It was because we were all together. So this state and the fact that it's purple uh, comes as no surprise to me just because of that block where I grew up. So someone listening to that now would say that there were a lot of angry conversations in your block and yelling at each other, surely, because that's how party politics looks now. What was it like growing up there and how was it different and what could we do about it? I do not remember angry conversations. Now, so I have heard some people reflect on the conversations in our neighborhood and, and, and they remember them that way. I, that's not what I took away from them. Um, I felt loved and welcomed by everybody in our neighborhood across all the different lines of difference. And, um, you know, I remember Sue Myrick and my dad working together on transportation issues very closely, um, even though they had, they had different political views on things. And so there was always a way um, for them to, you know, the things that have stuck with me are our common humanity and the need for civil discourse and my belief that the best ideas emerge when we are talking across lines of difference. So how do we change party politics as we know it now, which uh, basically rewards someone for being extreme and talking smack about the other person? Well, I hope that's not what, <laughs> that, and maybe I'm naive, but you know, out and about across North Carolina, when I think about party politics, I think about it maybe on a more um, macro level, on what it means for our state versus on the individual race level. And I've been doing this for a long time. I started doing this work back in you know 1993, and so in 1994 was the first time where there were significant Republican gains after more than a hundred years of. Democrats dominating politics and I wrote back then that I thought we were kind of testing the waters around party politics and thinking about whether it, the changes were reactionary, you know, anti-democrat, anti-tax, anti-big government. Um, were they um, revolutionary? Were, was this a reaction to the hum, hundred years of democratic rule and were you going to see Republicans hold on to leadership for much of the 21st century? Um, or was it evolutionary? Are we looking for some kind of balance in party politics among the state and across the party lines? You see that in the changing uh, membership. You know, more people are registering as unaffiliated. And what's that going to mean for party politics? Will the parties go in and try to reach those voters or will they try to push those voters back into the parties over time? Um, but I think this coming, the 2020 elections is a 10 year election. We talk about who wins the majority, gets to draw the maps, has the momentum, gets to raise a lot of money. And so we're looking at that and thinking about what it means for education and what it means for the future. The uh, Center for Public Policy Research, the North Carolina Center for Public Policy Research is now under the umbrella of Education NC. That's been historically a print journal. Uh, it's been historically something that is uh, takes a lot of time to look at issues and come back with a, a nonpartisan view on that. How's that organization changing over time? Where do you see that going? So our, you know, we call ourselves a collection of nonprofits and initiatives, and we have Ed NC, we have the Center for Public Policy Research, we also have Reach NC Voices, which I mentioned, and First Vote NC, which is a platform for high school students to give them the experience of voting in elections. The work, and I worked at the Public Policy Center for most of my career and grew up wanting to work there, and I was the editor of the print journal. Um, and what I can tell you is, is that our work is largely the same as it's always been. We, we try to identify the most important issues facing North Carolina, and we try to do independent research that takes into account um, all of the both qualitative and quantitative aspects of those issues um, that need to be considered as we think about solutions going forward. And what has changed is how we distribute that information. So nobody these days is going to sit down and read a many hundred page report like I used to spend a lot of my life producing. So your children are not 
sitting down and doing that. They're not reading, yeah. you know. They're not, they, they wouldn't read North Carolina Insight like I did. Um, but what they will do is read, you know, an ar article that's maybe 750 words, right? And so we take that same body of research and chunk it up into articles and release it in real time. And one of the interesting things that it does is it creates a feedback loop for our researchers. So they're getting feedback from the from the public as they're reading this research um, in a way that I think produces um, more informed public policy research, but I also think it has given us the ability to be proactive instead of reactive. So often in my career, um, policymakers would do something and then we would study what they did and say, well, this is what they should have done. Um, but we have the ability now to know what the issues they're going to be considering, pr produce and release the information quick enough that it informs their deliberations and create change, I think, on the front end. We saw some of that with the class size, the K-3 through class size debate. Got it. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit with you about uh, civility and social capital uh, in North Carolina. And I'm thinking about a study that was done probably 15 years ago now by a group called the Cigarro Institute, which was one of the offshoots of Robert Putnam's work mm -hmm. on uh, uh, civic engagement. And what it found was that in North Carolina, we are really good at this thing he called bonding social capital. So we're really good at getting together with our church group or with our civic group that we belong to, uh, and sometimes with our neighborhood group, where we rank lower than other states is in our tendency to reach across the lines of race or geography or income. And so North Carolina is an outlier in our ability to do these activities related to bonding social capital. We are an outlier in a negative way in our ability to do things that involve bridging social capital, reaching across those lines. And I'm wondering what your ideas are about how we could get better at this bridging work. Yes, yeah, so we've been talking about a lot about the art of gathering and the need for gathering. And some of that started when Education Commission of the States came in and briefed a group of thought leaders earlier this year about um, where they saw changes in education that were positive in other states where they saw positive changes in education. Even if they were as divided as North Carolina, it was because people were having coffee was because leaders across all lines of difference, whether they agreed or not, were willing to sit down and have coffee. And they had these relationships because of that that would allow them to find common ground and move policy forward even in our polarized, politicized times. And so we've been thinking about, well, what does it take to get people to have coffee, right? And to start there and then to begin to build the bridges that you're talking about across all the lines of difference. We did some surveying earlier this year and we found that 89% of those surveyed in North Carolina believe society's more divisive than five years ago. Not really surprising. 88% said divisions and divisiveness are dominating our public conversations. 81% had experienced divisiveness in family, work, and community. And 56% said they thought incivility and divisiveness were impacting our state's ability to ensure that all citizens could succeed and thrive. So I think you see in those numbers that this is important to people, that they're worried about it. I think one of the things that concerns me the most is um, there's beginning to be some conversation about civility being a bad word and that the call for civility is actually a call to suppress speech. And I think that, you know, that's part of our challenge is to make sure that people continue to talk across all the lines of difference, right? Um, but we need to be, have this kind of honest discussion around what civility looks like these days um, and what it means for the important issues of equity um, and in people's lives and in their communities. Yeah, it's interesting. We we didn't do a scientific survey, but we did reach out to the 31,000 people who are on our mailing list and ask them, uh, as the Institute for Emerging Issues, what the biggest issues facing North Carolina were. And at the end of the day, all the issues that came up had something to do with this 
inability to talk to each other or this feeling that we had lost something that was unique and important to our state, that we were getting disconnected from each other and that it was important to do something about it. And uh, there was this opinion that, that came in various forms that said it has something to do with our inability to talk to each other. Right. Um, I've heard there's a there's a national movement called Three Cups of Coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and as I understand it, the notion of three cups of coffee is you'd have one cup where you listen to somebody and another cup where they listen to you and then you'd have a real conversation on the third cup. Right. But it's interesting to think about coffee as a, a great homogenizer, especially since I drink tea. I think one of the things I've most enjoyed about um, my work is that on any given day, I do get to have coffee with people on the far left and people on the far right and everybody in between. Um, and it has been very helpful to me in thinking about how to think about um, solutions and change within the education system and how to build a 21st century education system for um, our students. You know, North Carolina is, um, we have 23 counties that voted 70 plus percent for President Trump. And then we've got this very blue urban core. But my job is to create an education system that works for all of them. And that's a different thing. So what have you heard that, that looks like or sounds like or smells like common ground to you when you talk about education? So I think the bottom line is that people all want what's best for students, right? And so people don't like change. Change is hard. And people don't like the feeling of, um, things being done to them. But when you can bring people together and make them feel included in the conversations from the beginning, um, and it's about how to build uh, an education system that works for our students going forward, I think that's where you begin to see conversations that will you know, move us in a, in a direction that will make us competitive, not just across the nation, but in the world. Uh you're a woman of faith, and I wanted to ask you about uh, a movie I saw recently. It was Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's the documentary about Fred Rogers' life. Yeah. And you're someone who tends to see complexity in public policy issues, uh, but Fred Rogers was somebody who saw simplicity in what he probably wouldn't call public policy issues, but basically his, his motivating principle for his television program and the people he worked with, which were largely preschoolers, was love your neighbor. And I'm wondering how that animates the work that you do through Ed NC. Yeah, the most important story that I've come across in my work for Ed NC was uh, the opportunity to, to meet and to get to know a middle school girl up in Madison County. And she wrote her story, and I'm gonna read you just a tiny bit of it. If I still lived with my mom, I wouldn't be here today. She wouldn't remember to bring me even if she was awake. I wouldn't get to go to school either. She'd say she was homeschooling, but she wouldn't. I wouldn't know who God is. I wouldn't have any friends. Maybe I would have grown up to be just like her, but I'm not. So her story's longer than that, but in even just that snippet, I think you can see that from being removed from her family by DSS, to living with her grandparents, to understanding what it's like for the first time to have access to healthy food, to have access to health care for the first time, to going to church for the first time. She grew up not knowing there was a God. Um, to learning in school that she loves science and loves to read. You can see all of the challenges in her story that our public schools face each and every day. And so it is this intersection of all the things that are the fabric of our society, whether it's our churches or our schools that build our communities. It's in the mix of all of that that I think we'll find the path forward. How do you translate a concept like love your neighbor into public policy? Is that just in the back of your mind or is it no, it's is in the it like forefront a touchstone? Of, it's in the forefront of my mind. I've been fortunate enough to do some leadership work with the Aspen Institute. and love is at the forefront of their leadership philosophy, right? And it's about connecting uh, leadership of the self and leadership of the organization to leadership of society. And it's about, you know, I think it's at the core of civility. It's about across all the different lines of, of, of difference, us being to connect across this very simple concept of humanity and what connects me and you and what connects me with the next person I run across. 
What do you think, in your opinion, is the biggest issue facing the state over the next couple of years? What do we need to be thinking about working on right now? So the thing that I'm thinking about, and this is in part because most of my work happens in education, is there is this window of opportunity that's emerging between the 2020 elections and how that shakes out with a couple of other big things that could prompt some significant systems change in the education space. So we have a long running lawsuit called Leandro. Leandro was the lawsuit that defined a sound basic right to education for all children in North Carolina. And that court has appointed an independent expert to advise us on what it would take to provide a sound basic education to all students in North Carolina. We also have a commission called My Future in C that is working with philanthropists and policymakers and business leaders and educators um, to think about what an attainment goal would look like for North Carolina. How many of our you know, students, um, career professionals, do we want to have um, a credential or a degree um, to be ready for the 21st century workplace? And so we've been out across the state in listening sessions. We're going to the Koala Boundary out in Cherokee later this week. and. Um, we will, you know, I think that the opportunity that the three of those things, how those three things come together and play out is really an interesting, uh, something I'm excited about watching unfold. So Leandro has been going on, I think for at least 20 years yeah, now. My whole career. You're, you're optimistic <laughs> that, that something could happen meaningful in the next couple of years? There are, there's, um, there are two different things happening. One is the independent consultant that's producing a report about the state and what it would take to provide a sound basic education. But the governor has also appointed a commission um, that would take that report and then figure out how to make it happen. And so between the work of um, My Future in C and the work around Leandro and then um, the political window of opportunity that might emerge, uh, I think systems change is on the horizon possibly. All right, looking 20 years out, what do we need to be thinking about now that's going to bite us in 20 years if we don't do something about it? Or an opportunity that we could be blessed by if we, if we planned ahead? You know, I think race is probably the one issue that has kind of vexed us for a very long time and that we still don't have a good answer to. I was in a, out in Asheville and visiting a program started by a school teacher called Youth Transformed for Life. And so I walked into this after school program in a church in Asheville and um, the first thing I heard was white person in the building and all of the black children ran and hid under the desks and it brought you know it brought tears to my eyes then and it'll bring tears to my eyes now to think that just because of the color of my skin um, it can that that in and of itself can frighten kids and I think we've got to have figure out a way whether it's through gatherings whether it's through bridging I know we've tried a lot of that but We've got to have some honest conversations around equity and what that really means for our communities going forward. So what does that look like? What do we do now? Yes, yeah, so for us it's been about creating a statement on what equity looks like for our organization and taking that out into community and getting people to um, react to it. But we basically, you know, ask that everybody that we work with have good intent without a hidden agenda, that we resist um, treating individuals as villains or invisible all along that spectrum, whether we agree with them or don't agree with them. Um, and I think the more people we can get to have this conversation with us, the better. You and I have talked a lot about, when you talk about the really hard issues like race or the really stubborn public policy problems facing us, it's not about one leader. It's not about one organization. It never is going to be. It has to be all of us working together if we're going to create change. Realizing it's never going to be about one person or one issue, is there one person you've seen recently who you think might be doing something amazing in 20 years that we should be on the lookout for? So, I mean, I'd go back to that program that I visited in Asheville. There was this young man, Tony Shivers, who, um, you know, <coughs> captured my heart and my mind that day because within five minutes of walking into that after school program, um, he had those kids doing yoga with me. Um, and he had come out of prison, and in prison he had learned about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and he had learned about trauma-sensitive learning, and um, he has committed his life to working with children um, 
to help them be able to uh, understand their adverse childhood experiences and have the tools to cope with them moving forward. And so between his mindfulness bell um, and you know the other techniques and tools that he used with those kids, he, he changed my life in, a, in addition to changing theirs. All right, so Tony Shivers. Tony Shivers. Tell me where again where he works. He's up in Asheville at a program called Youth Transformed for Life. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you for being with us. Mevin Rash is the CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Education NC. We thank you for being with us, and we hope you'll join us next time on First in Future. Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.